Hey everyone, welcome to the Guided Programming Coaching Call. I'm Mike Tushir. I've got an interesting call here planned for you today. Uh, lots of good questions, so uh, without any delay, let's jump into things. Uh, starting with uh, executing the workout. So uh, executing the workout questions, for those who maybe aren't so familiar, uh, they're questions about uh, just how to go through your training on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, what kind of stuff can you expect? Um, how do you perform the training, stuff like that. So uh, with that, let's uh, go ahead and take the first question, which is how do I determine my working weights? Uh, determining your working weights is something that's covered in uh, the startup documents. So when you first started with guided programming, you got an email called um, startup. And there were a, a whole ton of attachments to that email. And uh, one of the attachments uh, I think is called executing the workout. So um, you might want to go back and review that one, but just in case you did and it's not clear or anything, we're going to talk about it for just a little bit. So how would you decide what weight um, to use in a general workout? Uh, there's two basic ways. One is have you done this movement before? And if you have, then you're going to base it off of that prior performance. Um, especially if it was recent. Uh, if you haven't done the movement before, then obviously you won't be basing it off of any prior performance, so you'll have to have another method. Uh, let's start out by talking about if you have not done the movement before, because that's probably the easiest. What you do in a case like that is basically you just work up. Uh, you, you take a guess, you know, you start on the light side and you increase the weight incrementally until you get up to the RPEs uh, required. Do your best to keep the volume where it needs to be. You know, I, I know that it's difficult. Uh, it's, it's hard to judge those RPEs correctly, especially if you've never done the movement before. Um, just be aware of that. Uh, do your best to keep the volume where it's supposed to be. Um, and, you know, just be as flexible as possible. In a, in a situation like that. Uh, most of the movements should be fairly familiar to, to you. Um, so let's assume for us, uh, now that you have done this movement before, uh, and it's been fairly recently, so how would you go about determining your working weights for that? Well, the way that I recommend and the way that's outlined in the instructions that I sent you is to take that uh, previous performance and calculate an estimated one rep max. And you do that by using the RPE uh, percentage table that's included in, in those startup documents. Um, so if you have done, you know, your last, uh, the last time you did pause squats was four reps at a nine. So you look up four reps at a nine in the table and you find uh, it's, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, let's say it's 80%. So you divide the, the weight that you use by 80% to find uh, your estimated one rep max. And now today, let's say you're doing triples at a nine. So you would look up that percentage and let's say it's 84%. So you multiply your estimated one rep max times 84% and that's gonna give you the target weight for the day. And I, I know I went through that kind of quickly, uh, but hopefully that explains it a little bit better uh, and allows you to understand what the startup documents are getting at. But if you don't like doing all that math, uh, you can still use, um, use your prior performances uh, to inform on you know, how you need to, to continue on uh, for, your, for your subsequent training. What you would do in that case, you just need to find, um, you know, find something comparable. So one thing that a lot of people do, let's say that you use, uh, for whatever movement it was, let's say uh, you use 200 pounds for four reps at a nine RPE last time. And this time you're required to do three reps at a nine RPE. Well, you know that it's gonna be a little bit heavier than you were last time. So if last time was 200, then you'll shoot you know, a, a bit heavier than that, you know, five or so percent heavier than that. Uh, so you'll probably aim at something like 205, 210, and you'll be able to dial it in as you work up because you obviously don't start at four reps at a nine. You'll start at four reps at a seven or something, 
you know, and so let's say you do 190 or something for four reps at a seven, then, you know, 197 for four reps at an eight, and you're trying to really dial it in on that, you know, four reps at a nine. So you'll be able to, to feel it out, feel how you're doing and, and get pretty close to it. That's a little bit more of an intuitive way, uh, not quite so much of a process, not quite so mathematical. So depending on what you're inclined to do, uh, you know, select whatever method uh, suits your personality the best. It doesn't really matter which method you choose because the whole point of this, the whole point of any of this, is just to put the correct weight on the bar. A lot of programs use percentages to try to put the correct weight on the bar, and that's fine if it gets the correct weight on the bar. Uh, but as you know, the reason that we use RPE in our training is because there, our performance fluctuates day to day. And percentages work fine if you're you know, not pushing the RPE very hard, but if you're really uh, you know, pushing more toward those limit RPEs, you know, 8, 9, 10 RPEs, then you need to have the flexibility to adjust up and down depending on the day's performance, which is uh, what all of this is designed to do. So as long as you're getting the right weight on the bar, it doesn't really matter what method you're using to, to find it. You know, it's just whichever one is most convenient for you and which one actually gets you the, the real uh, effects. So next, executing the workout question. Um, when doing two count pause squats, should I pause under tension or just sit in the hole? And this is an interesting question, I thought, because it's not a question that, that I've got before, but I see kind of a, a trend. Um, we definitely pause under tension. I don't want you to sit and relax in the hole. I frankly don't see much value at all in doing that. Um, the whole point uh, of pause squats and pause anything in this program is to help you build strength. Strength is tension and you need to practice that tension. So for the pause squat in particular, we're trying to build strength in the bottom of your squat. And the way that we do that is by practicing tension in the bottom of your squat. So you don't want to just sit and relax and, and not produce that tension because that's not going to really help you uh, get any stronger. We want you to hold that bottom position and that'll do a couple things. One is uh, it's more time under tension, so it's just more mechanical work, uh, or, or yeah, it's more muscular work uh, in that bottom position, and that will result in you know a net improvement over time. Uh, the other thing that it does is neurologically it helps you by practicing that bottom position, you know. So I, I want you to pause in the bottom, you know, don't don't relax in the bottom. I, I don't wants you to necessarily pause above the bottom either. You know, it's not about that. Um, just practice that bottom position and, and you'll be fine. Uh, let's move on to some kind of related questions. These are have more to do with modifying the program. Uh, this first one says, I'm going into my last week of the SI joint rehab protocol. Everything's feeling good. Uh, when I return to normal training, should I complete the standard protocol that's the, the one that's sent every week, or do I need to change it? It's frustrating that I've missed four weeks of the volume block for squats and deadlifts. Um, I understand that, that that's frustrating, and you know that's that's important too uh, that you've missed the volume block. So we don't necessarily want you to jump back into anything crazy. Uh, so I'm going to recommend, and this goes for everybody doing the reintroduction stuff after an injury. Um, I'm going to recommend that everybody just use some common sense. If you have just spent the last four weeks training with sub 60% weights, don't come back in week one, execute a single at an 8 or 9 RPE. It's just not going to be productive. It's not what we're looking for. It, you know, and you're probably not feeling like, like that's a great idea either. So, you know, listen to that little birdie on your shoulder. Basically, what I would recommend that you do in, in a situation like that, let's say that you get next week's protocol, and it calls for, you know, singles at nine or, or whatever. I don't think you should do it straight away. You've been modifying things, uh, and you're reintroducing. So continue to reintroduce. 
skip the single, maybe do an extra couple rep sets to make up for it. Uh, I would keep the RPE down. You know, keep the reps up a little bit, you know, preferably, you know, in the four plus range. Keep the RPE around eight or so, um, you know, but always, always, always pay attention to how you're feeling, especially in these first few weeks post-injury. I know that you spent the last four weeks doing it, and I, I know you, that you said that you're feeling frustrated for having missed those training weeks, and I know that that can get super frustrating. So missing those training weeks is, is not fun, and it can kind of lead to this impatience, right? So that it gets to the point where, you know, it's like, man, I, I missed those four training weeks. I need to get back into this, like, now, you know, and the tendency is to want to, you know, restart heavy training straight away. Uh, fight that urge. You know, just don't don't let that make you make a bad decision. You know, uh, keep the RPE in check, uh, keep the weights in check. You know, now is certainly not the time to re-injure. You know, so even if even if you keep things on the light side, let's say you know you're you're being smart and you're starting to work up and you feel that something's not quite right, you know, then call it, you know. I mean, of course, we don't want to do that forever, you know, but especially while this injury is fresh, it's better to be on the conservative side. Avoiding re-injury is the fastest way to make progress after you've had an injury. So, um, yeah, you, you've definitely got to do that. So uh, there's a question that came in. I want to just make sure that that's not a follow-up to anything. Uh, Nope, everything looks looks all set. Good. All right. Next question we've got says, I'm traveling this week, and the gym I'm lifting at doesn't have round plates. They just have those 12-sided plates. Should I switch my day two and day four so that I'm rack pulling uh, with the, the weird plates, and then I can do my competition deadlift when I get back home? Uh, if so, would I keep the loading the same or would it interfere with next week's training? Yeah, feel free. Go ahead and, and swap those days around. That's why they're listed out in priority order like that so that you can make those switches as, you know, and, and get quality training in to the maximum extent possible. Definitely go. feel free to go ahead and make that switch. Uh, you do not need to modify the protocols in any way. Um, that's also, I mean, more or less built in. So um, you shouldn't need to make any modifications. As long as you're getting your work in, uh, you'll be fine over the long term. So I wouldn't worry about that. That should be a, a fairly straightforward scenario for you. Just swap those days, and then next week when things are normal, you pick it up as normal. That's all the uh, programming modification questions. We're going to jump down to some GPP-related questions. This first one says... Um, I've been doing pull-ups instead of rows in my GPP workouts. Is that okay? Short answer is, yeah, that's fine. What we really want is we want to see you doing some, some back work. Um, I, I have a slight preference that you do some rowing, but I know pull-ups are, are easy in terms of setup time. Uh, they're a bit of fun, uh, depending on your personality. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if you prefer pull-ups, which you clearly do, then go ahead and knock yourself out. You can do a ton of them. Um, do some rowing, for sure. Um, it's worked into your program in some ways. It wouldn't hurt you at all to do a little bit of extra rowing. Uh, but if you want to have, like, a really heavy emphasis on pull-ups, that should not be a problem. Um, if you, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's actually about all I can think of to say on it other without uh, getting really repetitive. So um, moving on to some kind of, <coughs> excuse me, moving on to some kind of miscellaneous questions here. Um, first one says, uh, how much progress should a person expect to make on average? Which is a question that I've avoided answering for a very long time, right? And it's a question that everybody wonders about, and there's not a good answer. I'm going to try to give you a better answer today but I realize that I'm probably putting my foot in my mouth uh, just because it's such a hard thing to nail down. So what I did, uh, I, I looked back 
through some some documentation and uh, you know various resources that I've come across over the years to try to find like what's the expectation like where do lifters like if you're a world class lifter if you're uh, where do world class lifters start out you know like how talented are they on average when they first start out and then how long does it take them before they're world class and of course we're talking about a group of outliers and there are outliers within the group of outliers as well uh, this thing is is you know fractal in a lot of ways so um, I, I just want to be clear on where I'm pulling my data from so that you can see there are some weaknesses to it but it gives us a, a starting point a way to estimate so basically by looking at where uh, elite lifters start out and then where they end up how long it took them to get there we can kind of see what what their average rate of gain was and it turns out to be around five Wilkes points on their total every 12 weeks so about five Wilkes points every 12 weeks um, now that's average that's not you know that's not the way it was all the time you know everybody has you know wildly successful cycles and then everybody has you know wildly disappointing cycles and in the beginning it's easier to make gains than at the end and yada 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 but on average it's about five Wilkes points per 12 weeks so if you keep that in mind you know you can kind of gauge your own progress a bit you know you can say well uh, you know I'm making average progress you know or hey I've added you know 15 Wilkes points to my total uh, in the last three months that's really that's really great uh, or you know you could you might say well I didn't add any so that's a problem the thing is that and the thing to remember is that even for people who are destined to be elite level lifters and are you know these outliers in terms of progress they're not making gains like that they're not making um, you know five Wilkes points every single 12 weeks it's just on average you know uh, so if you have a cycle where you have a no gain or something like that it's not the end of the world and it doesn't necessarily mean that oh it didn't work it just means that it didn't work yet uh, and it could be that you know this nonlinearity in your progress is you know may, maybe it's a biological requirement you know it might not be possible for you to you know gain strength um, every single cycle you know it's probably not possible for it for that to happen even under ideal conditions and that's another thing the further you get away from ideal conditions the worst progress you should expect so you know if you're not sleeping well or you're missing workouts and stuff like that then you know your expectations diminish uh, fairly rapidly so that should give you something to maybe think about I mean don't you know don't um, hold that up as a gold standard or anything it's basically just an estimation based on some like rough research that I've done um, it, it may not hold up to, to very rigorous scrutiny uh, we don't know it might be great but uh, my uh, my gut feeling is to take it with a bit of a grain of salt so there's a question that came in. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure this question's on my list. Uh, stand by, Jake. Let me make sure. Yep, I got your question on the list, Jake. Uh, we'll get to it in just a minute. I may, may have uh, put it in the wrong category, but we, uh, it is on the list. All right, so uh, actually, I'll just kind of go out of order a bit, and I'll get to Jake's question next. So uh, basically, the the short version of the question is, how do you you know how do you modify training? How do you restart training after a two week break? Let's say you have a vacation or something comes up, and you do basically no training for two weeks. How do you manage that when you restart? Uh, it's a lot like what we were talking about uh, with the, the guy coming off the SI joint injury. 
So you come off this SI joint injury and you've been, you know, doing light training for four, uh, four weeks. Uh, you're, you can clearly be a little bit more aggressive if it's just a, a layoff, you know, because it's, you know, there's no injury to contend with, you know, there's no, you know, structurally weakened tissue that we're concerned about. So you can be a bit more aggressive, but the general rule stays the same. We want you to, you know, approach your training intelligently, use some common sense. If you've been resting for two weeks, you probably don't want to just jump right back in with a really heavy double or anything crazy like that. So, you know, keep your head about you. Um, you can still train fairly heavily. Uh, it just, yeah, it just wouldn't go kind of toward those end ranges. I would make sure, you know, maybe for a week or two that I'm keeping my RPE around 8, 8.5. You know, just be a little conservative with your RPE. Uh, definitely adjust your weights. Uh, your weights will probably be quite a bit different. So uh, pay attention to that. Um, for me, I generally try to give myself at, at least a 5% buffer. So uh, let's say that, you know, when I'm working out those target weights, I'll subtract an extra 5%, um, you know, just to, just to give myself a a little bit of a buffer and if it's an easy day, if it's an easy week that first week back no big deal you know it's your first week back you haven't had any stimulus in the last two so uh, that first week back will be stimulus even if your RPEs are undershot so it's okay uh, that's part of part of the process and that'll help you dial it in for the next week as well you'll get nice uh, fresh you know post uh, vacation numbers and you'll be able to dial in your training after that. Um, so, Jake, I'm glad that you're you're here listening live. So, if that uh, answers your question, great. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, type type something into me and let me know, and uh, we'll come back around to it. Uh, next question up is about foot angle. Uh, what foot angle should some person use when they're doing sumo deadlifts? So. Just in general, a good starting point for you, you want to keep your foot in line with your femur. So when you're in that bottom position, you know, and uh, if you imagine that your, your thigh bones just kind of went off into a line, you want your foot to be basically in the same line. Uh, so that means for a sumo deadlift, basically the wider your stance, the more toes out you, you turn. That's a good starting point. It doesn't always stay there, and it takes a little bit of experimentation, but that should provide a pretty decent starting point for you. Uh, next question is, um, how do you really perform your squat? Can you break it down uh, step by step, the cue setup, uh, how you push, press up from the floor, do you drive with your glutes, uh, your back, so on? How much of the work are the quads doing, stuff like that? Um, Interesting question, and um, uh, so it, I'm giving a seminar this weekend. Uh, a bunch of us are going to Florida for a seminar. We're really pumped about it. Uh, this is one of the presentations that I'm going to do there. Uh, it's not just for the squat, but for all the lifts. So you guys will get a little sneak peek as, as to what I'll be talking about this weekend. Um, so the idea, um, the idea is this. When you... Uh, when you approach the bar, um, first you set your grip. That's always the first thing that you set. You want to try to have a narrower grip um, as much as your shoulders and elbows will allow. Uh, we also kind of recommend that your default position is thumbs around the bar. If you have any joint pain, you know, wrists, elbow, shoulder, then you can go uh, thumbs behind the bar instead. Uh, then you're going to want to set your bar position. Um, I don't really care that much if it's high bar or low bar or whatever. Low bar does typically lead to stronger squats, although uh, some people with some leverages have some difficulty uh, reaching depth with a low bar position or it causes them to default into a really wide stance. So at that point, you set your bar position, um, you take a few deep breaths, then, right before you take it out of the rack, it's one deep breath in and hold. You brace your abs like you're bracing for a punch. Uh, then you stand up. Uh, we recommend a three-step walkout. 
Uh, Matt Gary has an excellent video on uh, the setup, and that's basically where all this stuff is mirrored from. I'm fairly certain that I posted that in the um, in the forum previously. So uh, check that out. If I didn't, somebody let me know, and I'll post it up there again. But um, the idea is just this three-step walkout. So you take the bar out of the rack, and your first step is straight back. Your second step is back and toward the outside, and it sets about half of your stance width. And then your last step is uh, just kind of an adjustment where you um, adjust that first foot so that your stance width and, and stance in, in total is set. So it's a nice, clean three-step walkout, and that, that allows you to get into a good position, uh, allows you to do so efficiently. Um, yeah, so at that point, you've got your stance, you've got your stance width, all this stuff is set. Um, you take a few more deep breaths, you know, as you, uh, as you settle. You know, when you're in a competition, you're waiting for that squat command. So at this point, you know, you're, you're letting things settle. You take a few more deep breaths. It's one last deep breath in and hold, and then, um, then you start your descent. I don't really care, again, whether you descend hips first, you know, you break at the hips first, or you break at the knees first. It doesn't really matter. You want the, the, the goal is to get into a good bottom position and get there relatively quickly. Um, so you're going to descend rapidly, and that bottom position, what's a good bottom position to be in? So um, you want to share the load across, across your joints. I mean, not evenly. It's not like it's uh, mathematically uh, equivalent or anything, but you want to um, share the load as, as evenly as your structure is going to allow you to do. So you don't want to necessarily you know, take on a stance that re and sit back super far so that all, uh, you have all hip extension, uh, or excuse me, all hip flexion in the bottom and you know, a minimal amount of knee flexion. You know, you want to distribute this load across the maximum number of muscle groups that you can. Now, when you drive out of the bottom, uh, we don't really teach a lot of, you know, hip drive or anything like that. Uh, it's more traditional, you know, drive, lead with your chest. Now, it's true that once the weight gets heavy, you know, you're going to have some hip drive. Uh, your hips are going to rise before the barbell. And, frankly, that's fine. I don't consider that a mistake. Um, you, you just stand up, basically. When the weight gets heavy, the hip drive will take care of itself, but your effort is still, you know, it's always the same. It's to drive the barbell up. Um, as far as cues, I'm not as, I'm not as heavy into these as I used to be. So I used to have, like, this whole squat checklist that I would go through uh, every time I would squat, you know, and, and I, even to the point where I had it pasted on the wall. You know, when I would go through this checklist every time I would I would uh, take a, a squat, it's it's not required though. Like after some time, you know, the movement pattern becomes more familiar. You get better at all of these things, and just in general, you don't you don't need that uh, sort of cognitive reminder all the time. And that's good. That's something that you want to strive for. It's funny because you want to strive for it. It's a good thing, but you can't rush it. You can't just, you know, it, it, it's going to happen on its own, basically. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that really answers your question. I see some some writing going on, so let me make sure that, that I'm answering these questions correctly. Whoops. All right, I think that answers that question. Um, all right, we have a couple other uh, miscellaneous questions that came in, so I want to kind of circle back and get those before we move on too far. So the first one is, uh, I have my program military press. Is this standing military press? What grip width should I use? Um, 
it's military press. If you want to do it standing, then knock yourself out. If you want to do military press seated, that's fine too. That's why it's written that way is to give you as much flexibility as we reasonably can. And um, I per personally prefer standing. And when I'm writing the program, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like I'm thinking like let's do these military standing. But um, if you, you know, don't have the space or you prefer them seated or you just like seated, I mean, it, it, it really doesn't matter that much. You know, if you want to do seated military, that's fine. No problems. Uh, next question is a follow-up from our previous question as far as, um, you know, the, the two-week layoff from training. Uh, it says that that just about answered the question. Uh, for him, it was one week of food poisoning and very limited on food. That's right. I remember this now. Um, I assume the solution would be the uh, same, perhaps just bigger weight drops. Um, use common sense. Lowering RPE slightly would be about all I can do for that, too. Um, yep. You know, even if, it, if it's food poisoning, uh, if it's, you know, a significant illness, it's not a vacation. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that means that there's probably a bit more of a strength loss. Uh, now, you would know because, if I remember right, you've done a bit of training, just it's been inconsistent and not very good. So, um, yeah, it, there could be a bit more strength loss than what we initially anticipated. So it would just, the, the plan stays the same, but it just means that we might be a little bit more conservative in weight selection, uh, just being cautious, especially in the beginning, you know, it's not going to hurt to be a little bit cautious, and that way you can get it dialed in and get things right uh, from there. If you start missing weights, it gets a lot harder to predict those things, so it's important to, to at least make weights, and um, yeah, it, it's easier to adjust up than adjust down. All right. So uh, this question says, regarding GPP, we do all the GPP protocols listed in the GPP section on the same day, or do we split them up over different days of the week? Uh, the ideal GPP solution is that you go through the GPP workout once or twice a week. Uh, if you have time to do twice, that's cool. Uh, if you only have time to do once, that's fine. If you have time to do none, uh, that's fine now and then. Uh, you don't want to make that a habit. If you are in a busy patch of life, GPP is clearly the first thing to get cut out, but it's not something that we want to cut out all the time. Um, yeah, so that would be uh, that would be how I'd split that up. If you need to split it up and do it on like after training days, maybe after one training day you do you know, your neglected muscle groups work, and maybe after a different training day, you'll do your energy system work. If that's how you have to do it, it would be better to do it than not. So uh, do it after your, your training sessions. The preferred way of doing it is to do your GPP on non-training days. But yeah, once or twice a week, go through that. Hopefully it doesn't take you very long. Uh, GPP workouts are designed to be a bit short and fun. Uh, they should be pretty fun. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in there to do different things in the gym, uh, kind of do some things that aren't, you know, your your typical powerlifting style workouts. So uh, hopefully the, the GPP sessions are relatively fun. Um, you know, I mean, it's not going to be a party, but, you know, even, uh, even riding a bike or something can be fun now and then. So hopefully you feel the same way. Um, let me know if you want uh, that question addressed a, a little bit different way or anything. Okay, so uh, that's it for the questions that we have right now. Uh, we're going to jump over here and check out some videos. All right, I'll, yeah, we're going to go over here check out this video. Uh, we want to want to review uh, this video uh, for technique on the deadlift. It says the deadlift is feeling heavy um, even at this weight. So uh, we'll just check this out, see what we can see. And um, as per usual, I'm going to be quiet while the video is uh, playing because uh, the sound messes up a lot of times. So uh, we'll go ahead and watch this.
Okay. Uh, I noticed a couple things. Um, not not much, but uh, first of all, the RPE, like you say in the, the title here, seven or eight RPE maybe, I think you're off on that. I mean, it looks like a freaking zero RPE. Um, it just looks super, super easy. I know that it feels heavy to you, uh, but if you're looking at the same video that I am, I mean, it's just the bar moves easily. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of grind to it. So unless I'm missing something here, uh, my tendency is to trust your assessment. So if you're saying 7 or 8 RPE, maybe, then I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but that looks super easy. Technically, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but I think it could be made better. I think you're trying to keep your hips high a little bit too much. I think if you got your weight further back on your heels, even if it means dropping your hips a bit, um, I think your pull is going to be better. You know, drop your drop your butt down, really pull the slack out of that bar and get super tight before you initiate the pull. Um, I just posted a video on my own YouTube channel uh, where I'm deadlifting. You can see from the front angle, uh, and you can see me pulling the slack out of the bar. Now, there's not going to be a lot of flex to the bar uh, if you're using 130 uh, kilos. Uh, that's not the point, though. The point isn't to make the bar bend before you go, but it's to get tight and to feel that tension in your body, get your weight back on your heels um, before you initiate the pull. Now, when you do that, you might get a bit of hip rise, meaning that you know, you're going to put your weight back, you're going to get really tight, you're going to pull the slack out of the bar, so your hips are going to go down a bit during your setup. And then when you start the deadlift, your hips might come back up before the bar breaks off the floor. I'm, I'm not overly concerned about that. I know that you know, mechanically that's inefficient, but if it leads to a bigger deadlift, then frankly, who cares? And I mean, you know what you're deadlifting now, so if you try it and you deadlift more, then I would continue, uh, you know, continue on that path. So give it a shot. You know, uh, sit back into your pull a bit more. Um, you know, really work on flexing that bar. You know, as much as as much as you can. Pull the slack out of it. Get nice and tight. And then when you uh, when you pull, if there's a little bit of hip rise, it's not a big deal. If it starts affecting your bar path, then we might have an issue. But I've not found that to be the case. Usually all the hip rise happens before the bar breaks off the floor. And then after the bar breaks off the floor, um, you know, everything is, is normal. So give that a shot. Let me know how it works out for you. All right, I want to uh, go back and pick up another question that came in before I move on. Uh, this question says, my first powerlifting meet is in 10 weeks. I'll be in the Masters Raw category. I need to buy a singlet and I've never worn one. Any suggestions on equipment I need to get? I have the lifting shoes and the belt already. Um, let's see. I personally like Enzer's singlets. Um, I mean, they're pretty standard wrestling singlets. They're not overly spandexy, but you know, they're stretchy enough that they work. You know, so personally for me, I like the fit of the Enzer singlets. Uh, they're not terribly expensive either. I don't, I don't think any singlets are hugely expensive. Um, so there's that. I mean, beyond that, uh, I can't think of. A lot of differences between them so a lot of it's just going to be a bit of style like what do you like you know what what suits your your preferences um, I know Titan has good singlets but none of them are like you know oh you've got to get this one you know it's just a singlet so whatever you like uh, is going to work just fine um, in terms of other equipment if you can get your hands on some knee sleeves um, that could be uh, beneficial but Considering you haven't, well, you're being your 10 weeks out, you can 
you could stand to, to get some knee sleeves. Right now, the SBD knee sleeves are kind of the, the go-to knee sleeves for, uh, you know, for serious raw powerlifters. But, I mean, there's, there's a ton of others out there that, you know, people like. People like the rebands. People like tighten knee sleeves. Um, those are kind of the big three right now. So you've got tighten knee sleeves, reband knee sleeves, and SBD. Uh, people seem to really like the SBDs. I know that I really like them. That's the ones that I wear. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So those are the that's the only equipment stuff that I can think of. If you've got the shoes, you've got the belt, then you've got your bases covered, and there's not a whole lot else that uh, you need to worry about. Uh, the other stuff's more. I mean, okay, so you'll need a singlet, but uh, in terms of knee sleeves and wraps and stuff like that, uh, it's more of the nice-to-have category than a requirement. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that helps. Let me know if you have any other questions, especially as the meat starts to get closer. If you have any meat-related questions, just send those in. I'll be happy to help you out. All right. Okay, we have a few explanation questions. Uh, this first one says, if there's no upcoming meet, shouldn't training always stay in the accumulation phase and never peak to make, the, to make consistent progress? Of course, lower rep ranges would be mixed in in between. I don't agree. Uh, if you... It... It's, Okay, so this is a bit of a philosophical question, so I want to back up and, and kind of let you know where I'm coming from. So I don't think that non-competitors need to be stuck in a, a perpetual accumulation phase. And the reason is that you your body stops responding to stimuli. You know, that's why you have to use continually heavier and heavier weight. But that's not the only direction that the stimulus goes in. You know, and if you manage your training process, you know, uh, I think it'll take you a lot further than just accumulating. So here's what, here's the way that you can think of this. If you, um, let's say that when you start out, it requires a certain amount of volume to see improved progress. And if you are going to just perpetually accumulate training volume because you're a non-competitor all you care about is getting as strong as possible so we're just going to do this accumulation so what, what do you do well you do perpetually more and more work right you never uh, vary the stimuli you never let your body adapt in the other direction you know you never have those um, those seasons of training where you basically just let the, the field lay fallow so what happens you accumulate more and more training volume and sure, you get stronger and stronger and probably stronger than your buddies who do something different, uh, at least in the short term. But what happens? You know, eventually, you know, basically you, re you require more training volume than you're, than you're able to, um, than you're able to do. And I'm, I'm sorry that this is kind of, uh, uh, I don't know. This isn't as well presented as I would like. Uh, I've got a, a slide deck in RTS Classroom where we talk about this. Uh, we talk about responsiveness to training, and that could be a helpful concept here, actually. So there's a, this notion that your body's going to respond to training. Uh, so how, if we were to measure you know, how well you respond, we would be measuring your responsiveness, right? If you continually do more and more and more training, then your responsiveness decreases. And when your responsiveness decreases to a certain point, then you're not really responding to much training. So what do you do at that point? Well, you have to do more stimulus, you know, so a lot of times it's more training volume. The thing is, it doesn't happen on this linear scale. Instead of where, if you have one athlete who really works their training cycles, so they maintain responsiveness they still stimulate the body, but they're maintaining this responsiveness to training. They're ma managing their current adaptation reserves and stuff like that. Uh, that athlete may not get strong super fast because they're not, you know, front-loading all this. They're not uh, playing the short game. They're playing the long game. 
but later on, you know, that person, uh, when that person gets to a 500 pound squat, they may still be doing uh, three days a week training. You know, now you have the other athlete who is just perpetually accumulating workload. So when they get to a 500 pound squat, since they've just been accumulating and they have to do more and more stimulus uh, to see improved training results, you know, maybe they have to squat five times a week to get to that level. Now, if you have to squat five times a week to get to, now maybe it doesn't matter because they're both at the same strength level, right? But if you take that further, you know, there's a, an upper limit on how much training you can do, even if you don't believe overtraining is an actual thing, which would mean that you're not really looking at, you know, the realities of, you know, human body. So, you know, there's just a time limit on how much training you can do within a certain period of time. So even in that context, you know, you don't want to do maximum volume as, as quickly as possible because it, it short changes you in the long term. Your work capacity gets better far faster than your strength level. And then, then what? That's always the question. So, okay, doing, uh, you know, perpetual accumulation or, you know, these extreme high volume training programs or anything like that, it may even get you better results in the next 12 weeks, but that's not always the point. You know, so what that you went from, you know, a 300 pound squat to a 360 pound squat while your, you know, your buddy only went to 330. Nobody cares. But what you probably do care about is how far do you get over the course of your career? Not even the course of your career, maybe the next two years. You know, do you want to, you know, do you want to see how far you can take this or are you just going to do this for the next couple months and then give it up? So, I don't know, I'm getting really long-winded on this, but it's an interesting topic. It's something that I like talking about. I'm not doing a great job of it here. Um, maybe we should maybe we should talk about this again sometime, and I'll try to be a bit more prepared. Um, but, yeah, responsiveness to training, current adaptation reserves, that stuff is important. So, um, yeah, that's why we manage the training volume the way that we do. And we'll kind of circle back around to this in one of the later questions. So for, for now, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, we're going to answer a couple more questions. This next one says, um, for the last two weeks, my squats have felt really good. Um, today, I had a small PR, and although it was six reps of nine, I felt like I had more in me uh, for some downsets. But the protocol called for no downsets, and track didn't add any either, so I feel like I missed an opportunity to push harder. So my question is, why no downsets? How does this fit into the overall plan? That's a really good question. And it goes back to what we were just talking about a little bit, uh, which was uh, responsiveness to training, um, you know, current adaptation reserves and things like that. This really comes in from the perspective of volume modulation we wave the volume up and down. It's not always waved up and down in order to allow you to recover. It's not always about, you know, pushing uh, to overstress the organism and then backing off for super compensation. Like, that's part of it, but it's not just about the strength levels, you know. So if you push your training, you know, and you're doing really high workloads, it's a stimulus for you to get stronger, but it's also a stimulus for a lot of other things, too. One of those things being increased work capacity. So uh, we talked about uh, just in the last question how that's generally a good thing. You know, you, you need increased work capacity, especially over like the mid and the long term. You need that work capacity to go up. But you don't want it to go up super fast. You don't want it to go up forever. Uh, we're going to run into some limits on how much training you can do. So the, uh, the low volume weeks allow you to resensitize to training volume a little bit so that the next time we, we go back up to normal volume, it's still a stimulus. It's still something that you're responding to. So we're, we're waiving the volume like this. The main reason is to manage your responsiveness to training. Now, responsiveness to training, a part of that is how well recovered you are and stuff like that, but it's also, there, there's also something more than that. 
you can be well recovered and just not get stronger in your training. When that happens, I mean, the best explanation that we have at this point is that your responsiveness to training, for some reason, your body is not responding to the training. Your sensitivity to volume is too low. So we need to reduce the volume so that your sensitivity comes back. And then when we return back to normal training, then uh, you're more sensitive and you're able to respond to that training. So I hope that makes sense. Again, maybe I need to do more on this at some point uh, so we can I'll bring in some graphics and stuff like that. So uh, I think that would be helpful. Um, if there's, if you have some additional questions on that, feel free to follow up. Now this question says, what's the reason for a single at eight RPE before you do rep work? Uh, now, in this particular instance, it's single at eight RPE, but it also could be a couple singles working up to a single at a nine RPE and whatnot. The point is to give you some highly specific practice. If you're a raw power lifter, that's exposure to heavy weights and the contest lifts, and it's done in such a way that uh, it's the most specific training that you can do. It's you know highly intense uh, because the weights are very heavy, and uh, it allows you to practice. You know, so one thing that you'll notice is that you'll do these for several weeks. What, what happens after you do that is when you go to the meet and you take your opener, which is typically more like a 7.5 RPE, um, it, it won't even be that stressful for you. It'll be routine because you've handled this weight for weeks and weeks. You know? So it's, uh, it's a great confidence booster in terms of uh, competing or testing, but it's the, the main reason for doing it, again, is just exposure to very heavy weights, ex exposure to those highly specific stimuli. Um, that's why, so when we plan singles at eight, we're looking to exchange a little bit of our volume for that high intensity work. When we do two singles, so a single at eight and a single at nine, we're looking to exchange um, even more of our training volume in exchange for this high intensity stuff. Now, we clearly don't stay there forever. It's, some, it's a tool that we use for a while and then move on. If you're an equipped lifter, it has a, another purpose as well. So all the same purposes still apply, but also it's an opportunity for you to practice competition technique. Com practicing competition technique is not a big problem for a raw power lifter. You know, they're able to do it on basically all of their work. But for an equipped power lifter, uh, a lot of times you don't have that opportunity. You know, if we're doing sets of four or five, something like that in your squat suit and knee wraps, chances of you actually hitting depth with a weight that you can squat for four or five reps, uh, probably not. So we throw those singles in there. You still, like there's still the purposes of, you know, highly specific training, uh, highly specific training effects and stuff like that. But there's the added uh, benefit of that's probably one of the few times that you'll actually get to squat to full depth in a full kit. Uh, that's probably one of the few times you'll get to touch your benches and so on. So uh, it, I would say it becomes even more important for your equipped lifters. So it's, it's funny, and I'll just go ahead and throw this out there now, but it's funny how um, there seems to be a bit of a trend. You know, if we take, if we go back, I mean, not even two or three years, the trend was more and more high intensity, more and more Bulgarian even. So we cut the volume, cut the volume, cut the volume, increase the frequency to make up for it and do lots and lots of high intensity training. But I see now that the popularity of things is swinging back the other direction. Now it's not high intensity, it's, it's low intensity. How low can you keep the intensity? How high can you put the training volume you know, maximizing this training volume, uh, both are good ideas and you don't have to do one or the other. You can modulate these things over the course of a training program and I think that that's beneficial to do that because they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses and if you can stack them together in such a way so that the strengths amplify each other and the weaknesses compensate, 
then I think that's kind of the best way to proceed with your training. So just something to think about. Uh, let's see, this question says, uh, how do you decide uh, on exercise volumes uh, for each training week? We touched on this a little bit already, uh, just that um, it's modulated in a way that uh, is supposed to help us um, you know, retain our, our responsiveness to training, uh, you know, manage our, our overreaching symptoms and stuff like that. There's not, so I teach, I teach RTS classroom and we have a series that's dedicated toward basically answering this question. How do you design a good training program? There's currently at least 10 hours just devoted to that one topic and I mean we can go a lot further in depth to it as well. So we clearly don't have that much time to go into it now, but uh, I can tell you this. It's the way that we modulate our volume and intensity exercise selection, basically all of it, boils down to which strategy are we using. And each strategy is a little bit different depending on what kind of person we're dealing with. Uh, in this case, you know, what's, uh, what's typical for this group of athletes. You know, and that's kind of how we place you in, in these different training groups. You know, and then we modify from there. We make further adjustments as needed. So it's, it's based on a strategy. The strategy is always a blend of other strategies. So you hear about these things like block periodization or DUP or, you know, Bulgarian method, the principle of specificity. So there's all this information out there. Almost nobody uses, like, a pure strategy. Almost nobody uses, you know, say, pure block periodization, especially not anymore. Uh, not in any sport that I'm aware of is that is that popular to use a, a pure periodization methodology. And what you'll find is that they're all blends. Even pure block periodization contains elements of linear periodization and stuff like that. So all the methodology that we have in these training programs that you guys get, it's all blends of other strategies and stuff like that. And it's constructed in such a way that we try to maximize the strengths, minimize the weaknesses of each uh, strategy so that you guys get the, the best overall training effects. You know, and we do look at long-term training effect, meaning, you know, months and years. We're not trying to, um, you know, get you great gains for the next, you know, six, eight, ten weeks and then, you know, have you guys burned out or, or uh, unable to continue or just not, yeah, not able to, to continue progressing. So that's a little bit, that's like the super, super short version and I know that that answer kind of boils down to, you know, well, it's because that's how we do it. Um, so I'm sorry about that. It just takes a lot of time to get into more depth on, like, how exactly these particular uh, training strategies are chosen. Um, maybe we can uh, have some further discussions about this a little bit at a time, but uh, if this is something that you're interested in, I would definitely recommend uh, checking out RTS Classroom. So we had another question come in here. Uh, wanna... Let's see, just want to make sure I'm not missing any questions. So. Okay, uh, so this question is basically in relation to the previous question on, uh, you know, why do you why do we have uh, no downsets? Why do we have low volume weeks uh, in the overall plan? Um, you know, yeah, it's kind of the same type of thing, strategy related answer uh, that I gave to the other question. Yeah, it's not not super simple. Uh, I like uh, I like how like the direction that you're going uh, with this question though. So, um, how do you know when to to have a low volume week? Well. If we, if we look at the training volumes in context and we see, you know, how, uh, how are we doing this? You know, how are we uh, managing the volume leading up to it? 
if we have a period of time where the volume is uh, medium and high for a while, then we should probably mix in uh, a low volume week just to make sure that we're keeping our responsiveness up. If, uh, and, th and this happens from time to time, we'll have somebody that, you know, despite these low volume weeks, the responsiveness still decreases. You know, they, they still fail to, uh, to respond to training. And in that case, it requires, you know, more extensive modifications. So the, the simple test that you can use is this. If you're feeling beat down uh, and not responding to training, then we probably need to make you feel better. We need to uh, deload so that you feel better. If you feel fine and you're not responding to training, you, even to the point where you feel good and you're not responding to training, which is, is what you were asking before, then we might have a responsiveness issue. It, it could be that uh, your responsiveness is too low. And it could also be that you uh, need more work, you need more training volume in order to continue progressing. It could be either one of those situations. And we need to look at the problem more closely and probably in some cases you just have to try one and, and see if it worked. Now, it only takes a few weeks to see if uh, it's a training responsiveness issue. And that's the direction that we hope it is. So that's usually the thing that I try first. So if you feel fine and you're not responding to training, the first thing that we're going to try is to make your responsiveness go up. If that doesn't work, basically it's not a responsiveness problem, then we will increase the training volume because that's what we have to do. So kind of to tie this back into what we were talking about earlier with you know, this uh, ideal of, uh, or this average of five Wilkes points per 12 weeks. If we, you know, you're not progressing, so we have to do something, so we try uh, modifying your responsiveness, you know, well, that 12-week period, you know, maybe there's not a very much gain at all, but that doesn't mean that the system's broken. It just means that it takes some time to figure out these, these issues sometimes. You know, and, and once we can figure it out, uh, then things should start improving again, you know, and, and you should see that, you know, hopefully that 5% average, you know, over the course of, you know, the mid and long term. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that's, I think that's about it for the questions today. Um, Okay, there is one more, and we'll kind of end on uh, a little bit lighter note. Um, this one, uh, this question is, uh, do you track protein intake, or have you done this uh, earlier? How much did it affect your strength? Um, food is fuel. Fuel is important for gain quality strength over time. I do track my food intake. Um, I think calories are the most important thing, then protein. Um, I recommend getting, you know, a gram of per protein per pound of body weight uh, or two grams of protein per kilo of body weight up to about 220 grams per day. I don't think it benefits you much to go past 220 grams per day. And for a lot of people, uh, it starts to make them feel bad. If you just like eating that much protein, that's fine. Uh, go for it. But I don't think there's a whole lot of benefit. As far as strength, I don't notice that protein intake affects my strength much or at all. Um, it probably affects body composition, which then in, ten, in turn affects strength over the long term, but I don't notice any real short-term effects from, uh, from nutrition in general, to be honest. Uh, as far as you make a comment, and I know this isn't part of your question, but I'm going to pick on it anyway. Uh, one of the things that you say in your email is, uh, I know food is fuel. And that's a mentality that I don't like or espouse. And the reason is because food is not really fuel, and there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, at a minimum, food is also an important social component. So this is, this is a really complex problem. You're dealing with biological organisms. So it's a really complex issue because 
it, everything affects everything else, and there's multiple different levels, right? And as athletes, we tend to focus on, you know, nu the nutritional aspect of food. What's in it? How many proteins, carbs, fats? Some people, the, the really particular types, are going to get into micronutrients, but most people don't have the time or energy to pay attention to that stuff. And um, so we're going to, like, stick to this nutritional um, quality, you know, uh, par carbs, proteins, fats. The issue that I see with that is that, one, weighing your food and, and you know, eating in, you know, this sort of style, I don't think is sustainable over the long term. Uh, the other thing is we, we tend to ignore the social impact of eating. Um, so consider this, for example. I know some people who, you know, when they're controlling their diet strictly, they, you know, maybe don't go out to eat with friends. Uh, or they, uh, when they do, it's a very stressful experience for them because, you know, they need to order particular things or, yeah, it's just stressful in general to, to try to eat diet food out with friends. So now uh, we have, you know, either social isolation or we have, uh, you know, added stress from, you know, the social exposure. So what do those things affect? You know, well, they could affect recovery, you know, and that could in turn affect, you know, the functional training volume. So tell me, how much how much benefit do we get from being super particular about nutrition, and is it enough to outweigh the, you know, the additional uh, social anxiety that comes from, from being that way? You know, or, uh, I mean, I'm not a nutrition expert. I'm not. So... You've got to take what I'm saying with a bit of a grain of salt. The thing is that from where I sit, I don't see a big impact from nutrition. And I know, again, at the seminar this weekend, uh, Ben Escrow is going to talk about nutrition. And I've heard him talk about it before, and that's the central message is that nutrition is important when it comes to body composition, so it can be helpful to you over the long term. But it's not it's not even a peripheral driver of your strength. You know, this is several uh, several priority levels down below uh, training. So for me, if, if eating a certain way is going to affect your ability to recover, um, be it from, you know, social anxiety or what, whatever, you know, uh, maybe you can't, you have difficulty getting enough calories in if you're eating certain types of food or, or whatever, you know then it's not a useful trade-off from a training standpoint. So I think food is a lot more than fuel, and I know I got way off of your original question there, but uh, food is a lot more than fuel. And when we kind of distill it down to, you know, putting fuel in the Ferrari or whatever other analogy people want to use, I think the tendency is to miss a lot of those points. So enough, enough about that. Uh, hopefully that answers your question regarding protein. Um, and I'm sure probably a lot more than that. So uh, sorry for uh, kind of unloading some nutritional philosophy on you from somebody who's decidedly not a nutrition expert, but uh, that's that's what I think. All right, so uh, that's all the time we've got, and uh, that's all the questions we've got too, so perfect. Um, make sure that you check the calendar for next week's call time. I'm going to be traveling back from the seminar, so... Um, just uh, bear with me. I may have to record that one. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I'll kind of have to see how my flight schedule works out. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll still have the call. I'll definitely get the questions answered and we'll have it available. Uh, just not sure yet if we'll be able to do it live or not. Uh, don't forget to send in any questions that you might have. Um, as always, good luck training this week. Um, Make sure that you take what's there, build some momentum, and we'll see you next time.